Today I spoke to Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank, the authors of the sci-fi series The Expanse. We talked about the sixth and final season of The Expanse TV show that just came out, and about the ninth and final Expanse book, Leviathan Falls, and we talked about sci-fi and writing and storytelling in general. The first half of this interview has spoilers for season six and book six of The Expanse. The second half of the episode, after the 50 minute mark, has spoilers for book nine, and also some spoilers for the Dune books I mentioned. There are timestamps for all of the topics and spoilers listed in the video description or podcast notes, so you can skip around or avoid spoilers however you'd like. Hope you enjoy. Daniel, Ty, thanks so much for coming to speak with me again. Happy to do it. So season six adapted the sixth book, Babylon's Ashes. It was a six episode season as opposed to a 10 episode season. So there was a lot that was cut and changed. There's also things that were added. Um, like I really enjoyed the character Tadeo being introduced to sort of personify Philip's guilt, I thought was really interesting. What were some of the additions to the story that you were most excited by in season six? I, I don't know if I would agree that a lot of stuff was cut. I, I think what happened was a lot of stuff got pulled forward into season five. The whole um, uh, Michio Pa story from book six became Drummer's story, and a lot of it played out in season five. So we weren't doing that. And I think the one big thing that did get cut was um, all the stuff happening on Medina Station, which yeah. is important in, in book six. Um but the, the reality there was just uh, the question of how much money do we want to spend rebuilding Medina for those stories. And it just, I mean, I think, I think those stories are important in the books to understand what's going on. But th we found other ways to tell those stories that didn't require us spending so much screen time on Medina itself. Um, but I don't know. What, what was exciting for you, Daniel? <laughs> well, I think adding in kind of the new Joseph and Michio, uh, the the show Michio, especially um, the the whole um, way that Belter family came together, I thought was really pleasant. I really liked those actors, and I really liked that storyline. Yeah, it was a very different set of personalities to Pa's family in. Babylon's Ashes, but they did have their own sort of unique dynamics going on in season six, which I thought was quite fun. Well, we, we still made Joseph the pretty one. <laughs> if you had to pick which one wasn't the pretty one, there's not a, I mean, there's not a lot of those. I, I thought that Rosenfeld was quite an interesting addition or change uh, as sort of this confidant to Marco who got there by calling him out to his face and disagreeing with him audaciously. Um, how, how was that role conceived? Where did that Rosenfeld come well, from? Well, I mean, we we state the problem in the show. Uh, the problem was that all the people who used to be able to stand up to Marco are all dead. And uh, so if you if you want to have Marco have any interesting conversations where people challenge his, his conclusions and push back on the decisions he's making, um, we had to create a new character. I mean, there, it was great when we had Sin. Uh, you know, Brent Sexton was fantastic, but yeah, he died. Um, and and we really, I mean, we had to be much more subtle with how we were playing out the the Philip piece of that story. We couldn't have Philip be the one who was constantly challenging Marco. Um, it just wouldn't have worked for where his character was going. So, right, was it your idea to pull in Rosenfeld? Well, there were a bunch of the uh, kind of other belters who showed up in the book who we sort of mixed and matched and put uh, mm -hmm. throughout the thing. I mean, uh, Nico Sandrani was was in the book. Uh, Rosenfeld was a very different character in the book, but the name was there. Um, and, 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 and Sandrani in the show got merged with, um, what's the other character that Sandrani got merged with? I always forget their name. Good fortune. I think it was good fortune. Good fortune. Yeah. Yeah. Sandrani kind of took on some of good fortunes, uh, personality and, and, and then there was Walker who showed up and, and was a very different character in the show. Um, so yeah, there was, there was a lot of kind of mixing and matching and, and shifting of, 
uh, character names and personalities around to fit what we were doing in front of the camera. Yeah, I, I noticed there were also some sort of butterfly effect sort of on flow changes that happened from earlier seasons. Like in Babylon's Ashes, you had Pella and Koto and Shin Sakuto as like the three wolves on Marco's fleet. But one of them got blown up last season, I think. So as a result, it was a different set of ships in season six. Were there other examples of those sort of um, expected or otherwise changes that happened as a result of earlier changes, like killing Fred in season five? You know, created changes. In well, season yeah, six? that 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 it would have been hard to kill him again. Uh, <laughs> felt a little odd, and and the uh, the coming together of the Belter tribes um, really got condensed into uh, Walker and Drummer's story, which, I mean, it tells the story. Um, it does the, the thing that it needs to do for the, the, the plot to work, uh, for the, the story to get told. But uh, it, it, that was a very different approach to it. And, you know, if we had had 10 episodes instead of six, it, you know, it, the story would have been a different shape. But um, for the for the time that we had and the uh, obstacles we were working with, that was the graceful solve. What's the first thing that you would have added or changed if you had a 10 episode season instead of a six? I, I probably would have spent more time. I mean, if we, had, you know, if, if time and money were no object. Yeah. Um, I would have spent, I would have spent um, more time dramatizing what was going on on Ganymede with Prax, just because I love Terry Chen so much and I love that story so much. Um, well, and it, that was initially the intention was to have a Prax story and uh, and an Anna story um, in the season that got you know basically cut down to those two little cameos. Yeah, and I also would have I was, would have canceled Foundation so that we could have gotten Jared. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was gonna say like Dawes' absence was felt because he had such a lovely chapter in Babylon's Ashes where he plays Kingmaker in order to rally the OBA yeah. behind Holden. And you know, I noticed that you know Dawes left after season two, but he was uh, in the wings of the story through. Uh, season four and, and season three, I think, where he sort of appeared as this, you know, OPA leader. Um, it's a shame not to have him, but I thought that the I thought that the role of uh, Walker was also enormously fun. That was a very charismatic performance from. Uh, yeah, we got lucky with him, right? Yeah. Um, yeah that that was a that was a that was a nice little addition. I. I'm pleased by that one too. I, I, and I did really enjoy Prax's storyline in Babylon's Ashes because it showed the experience of an average person under the Free Navy. And, and as well as the Medina Station storyline, it showed how the Free Navy is not necessarily liberation for the Belters. For some Belters, it's just a different oppressor. Because um, you had one of those Medina guys was beat up by Free Navy. Prax was arrested by Free Navy. Um... Was that part of the goal with those Prax and Medina storylines showing average life under the Free Navy? I mean, I, I think it it's not specifically the Free Navy. I mean, it was the Free Navy in that example, but it's it's life under a new authoritarian regime. Um, and, and that's that's the problem with revolution, right? That that revolution often not always but often overthrows one authoritarian regime and replaces it with a, a brand new authoritarian regime i mean I don't, I don't think anybody living in russia found their quality of life greatly improved when they overthrew the czars and replaced them with stalinist communism i mean i i, I think i think yeah we yay we won we defeated the czars and now stalin's you know killing a million people a month um in his in his great purges uh, was that better? Probably not. And I think I think the experience of of seeing somebody thrilled that their revolution worked and they threw off their old oppressors, and then realizing, oh, here's the new oppressor, same as the old oppressor, um, is an interesting way to sort of analyze the the stories we tell about revolution and and uh, freedom and oppression, like 
those you know a lot of those stories are are pretty fictional. Yeah, that's what there's a reason they call it the Reign of Terror. It wasn't the Reign of Good Times. <laughs> so one of the themes throughout the expanse is the idea of political and cultural differences dividing humanity into tribes and the horror of the conflicts that come from that and the importance and the heroism of finding unity and cooperation. Um, but at the same time, I thought it was really interesting that in season six, especially episode five, season six, where there was a lot of talk about the importance of fighting for your tribe. Bobby says that it's all about like fighting for the people who have your back. And Naomi's like, it's all about, you know, the ones that you love and protecting them, which is, which is sort of positive about the idea of, you know, holding your tribe and your family above others, you know? So I, I thought there was perhaps a tension there between, you know, wanting to fight for your tribe and your family, but also the need to let go of tribalism for unity. So, so was that kind of a tension that you guys were consciously exploring there? Yeah, I mean, that's the that's the great um, problem with with all of human history, right? Is that uh, we do want to protect the people we care about. We do sort of by default place them, you know, in the first position when it comes to uh, helping people. Um, and also, the great problem with humanity is tribalism and us protecting ours and and telling everybody else to fuck off. Um, so both of those things exist in us at the same time. And yeah, I mean, I, I, da neither Daniel or I have an answer how you solve that. <laughs> but um, I mean, it's definitely there. And, and Bobby's perspective on that is very much a soldier's perspective. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've known a lot of military people in my life, you know, many relatives who are in the military. And that is absolutely the military perspective on it is it doesn't matter what the cause is or whether you think you're right or wrong, there is a guy in the foxhole next to you covering your flank and you're covering his. And that's that in the situation where your, your, your lives are at, at risk. That is the only thing you can think about in that moment. You can't think about the larger political perspective because bullets are coming at you and somebody's trying to keep you alive. Um, so it's a, it's very it, soldiers have always boiled it down to that perspective. When you're in the foxhole, you you got to abandon the politics. I think there's also something about tribal identity being sort of inauthentic in a way that like actual personal relationships aren't. Um, when you're in a foxhole with a guy, there's a guy there, and it's a person. It's not it's not a tribe member. It's it's Bob. It's Joe. Um, the the tribal break for me comes when we start saying well i'm you know uh a new mexican well oh i'm uh a republican or a democrat or i'm uh a presbyterian or you know when, when it winds up being this nebulous um impersonal identity that you're identifying with that's when it starts getting more anxious for me and I, so for me I think the the repudiation of tribalism and the embrace of these kind of genuine one-on-one -on -one authentic personal relationships those fit together for, in my head pretty well. Yeah, maybe the difference is that you know when someone identifies as one of those broad categories, one of those broad political or national car um, categories, that's something more superficial than the tribalism of family, of relationships, of something that's human and authentic. There is a important difference between those different kinds of groups. Yeah, I mean, that, that, is, that is the problem with all human interaction is, is human, humans became what we are in small family groups for hundreds of thousands of years, and those tool sets we have don't scale well. Um, you know, I mean, if you're if you're protecting your family against the other tribe in a hunter gatherer society, that other tribe is like ten guys, and if you if you hurt one of them, you you have to look at him, you have to stick him with your spear while you're looking in his eyes, right? Um, when the when we scale it up, like I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat, then you're calling for the harm of people that you haven't met, that you will never meet, that you will never actually see the outcome of that harm personally. 
it doesn't scale well. It's it's much it's much harder to make the decision to stick somebody with a spear who's standing there looking at you than it is to say all those people over in that other state of that other political party they should all be thrown in jail. It's it our our, our tool sets are not are not designed for this. Which is the problem yeah. with the internet, right? Um, and those questions. We were doing this. We were doing this before the internet, though. I mean, <laughs> this this is the technology is only so much to blame. While you mentioned Bobby, you know, while we're talking about the really important questions, I've got to ask that scene with Amos and Bobby, uh, where Amos is bedecked in glitter. And there is a moment when Amos is like, hey, Bobby, want to come to the brothel with me, you know, together? And then she's like, uh, and then the scene sort of ends. Can you give a canonical answer on whether is there any ambiguity there? Is it possible that Bobby did go to the brothel with Amos? Was there a po- was, is there something open for the fanfic there, or was that? Uh, what was I, that? I think fanfic is gonna is gonna happen whether or not we put our stamp of approval on it. <laughs> I, don't, I, th- I think Daniel and I are well aware that we have no control over what <laughs> fan theories and fan fiction are going to do. Um, <laughs> but I will say that one one of the things that uh, I saw repeatedly when people talked about it on like Twitter and things like that is people seem to have forgotten that our brothels in the expanse future service all genders. So it's not like if Bobby went to the brothel with Amos, he would be the only boy there. Um, So I don't know if she went with him or not, but I also know that if she did, um, she had a wide variety of options and, and it wasn't just him as the only (laughs) option. Um, yeah, and and you know at least in in the the version of Amos that that Daniel and I uh, created and and believe in, um, he was never particularly concerned when he went to the brothel with gender either. You know he was going to take whatever suited his fancy in the moment. So I think I think there's a lot of um, flexibility there in what everybody's interested in and and what they may or may not have decided when they got there. Um, okay. And I'm certainly not going to be the one who figures that out any any canonical answer is less interesting than where we are right now yeah. of course i uh, i could certainly see um uh, as drunk as they were and uh as as sort of loosey-goosey as i believe amos's uh sexual adventurism is i could certainly see a whole lot of people in a big pile and <laughs> who knows which of those two people be bumped up against each other at any given moment <laughs> <laughs> Emotions were high. The apocalypse was nigh. Anything could have happened. Yeah. I mean, Amos has got money. He thinks he's going to die. He's going to spend it all now, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't He doesn't strike me as someone with a large savings account. Yeah, he, he's, he's not, uh, not looking for the long term, hmm. which, you know, ironic, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very, which we'll get to. Another relationship I found interesting and ambiguous was in the... Uh, x-ray bonus scene one ship thing there was that feature with drama um exploring her relationship with naomi and we find that drama has kept all of these video messages from naomi and her partners michio and joseph think that that means that she sort of secretly has feelings for naomi and her heart is conflicted a way to interpret that as drama having like a romantic interest in naomi or is it more of just her close friend that she sort of wishes she could see more or is it ambiguous? What are we to interpret there? I, I mean, I, Oh, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, you, you, you can take this one. Uh, I would. Yeah. So that started out mostly because those two actors have so much chemistry, you know, that was, that was never the intention of the writing, but those actors have had so much chemistry in their scenes together. And the thing that, you know, everybody on the show jokes about is that Tara G has sexual tension with literally everyone. Like <laughs> some, not 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 her as a person. Like I've hung out with Kara many times with her husband and her kid, and like there's not there's not a flirty thing in her in her normal life. But somehow when she becomes drummer, drummer just has this smoldering sexual tension with every single person <laughs> in the room. And I'm not sure how that happens, but it totally does. And so there was this this. You know, there was this tension, this chemistry between the two of them. Um, and they really played into that. The two actors really played into that. So we wrote to it. Um, and I definitely feel like everybody agrees that if if Naomi had wanted to join Drummer's extended 
polyamorous family, she would have absolutely been welcome to do so. Like, I think, I think drummer would have been thrilled by that. Um, that's not Naomi's particular predilection. That's not her, her sort of the romantic life that she's looking for. So she never, you know, she never got pulled into it. But um, I definitely think that there is a bit of an unrequited thing there where drummers like, gosh, I wish I could have gotten convinced her to come join my, my polyamorous family. And she never did. So, you know, that unrequited thing, I think, is definitely played up there. And that's connected to Naomi's identity conflict, right? Because, like, you know, Naomi chooses not to live as a belter with belters. She chooses to live in this weird amalgam Rossi crew family with, with Earthers and, and a Martian. Um, and we saw Naomi attempt to join the belter nation on the behemoth in season three. Uh, but she found that wasn't her home and she chose to live on the Rossi instead. Um which I thought was so fascinating. And, and and also what is awesome is is the polyamory of Drummer's family connects to the philosophy of the Belters who are living on ships. And so the family arrangements evolve out of that world building. Um, I've seen a lot of people who are really excited and appreciative to see polyamory represented in The Expanse as well as different gender identities, ethnicities and stuff. Um, what is your goal and what's your philosophy for representation and diversity in the expanse? No, I mean, well, Daniel I, and I always give the same answer. So go ahead, Daniel. <laughs> you know, I, the, the thing we, we have said is we want the, the future that we represent and the future we, we, we present to be um, as rich and varied and interesting as the present we live in now. Um, we want people to, to, to look at the future and see themselves there. And that's, that's part of that. Um, and the, the polyamory in drummers, uh, family is certainly the one we see, uh, on screen the most, but you start looking at Holden's family. It, it, it was there from the beginning. That's always been part of the world building. Um, and the way that we've approached all of this was to have things be present, but uncommented. I mean, you, nobody ever says, oh, we are in a polyamorous family. It's part of our culture. You know, they're just there and you pick up on it. Um, the the uh, Martian ambassador is there with his husband. Don't talk about it. Um, Anna and, and her wife and their daughter are just present. We don't talk about it. And that that's um really kind of a core decision that we made about how to go about representing uh, um a diverse and interesting future yeah i i that is the answer we always give and that is the right one um but i would say i would add on to that because daniel just reminded me of something that what i like about that sort of representation is nobody's explaining themselves um, and I, I really feel like if we reach a point in our social evolution where nobody feels obligated to explain their lifestyle choices to other people, um, then that, that, that will mean we have made a significant improvement. Um, I, I, think, I think if you meet somebody and you, know, if, uh, you ask them out and they say, oh, no, I'm gay, and that's the end of the conversation as far as like explanation, that's great. Um, or, you know, your, your, your son brings his new, uh, significant other to the house for dinner and it's a boy and nobody has to explain. It's like, that's just, it doesn't matter. Um, that's what we're trying to write is that, you know, people come over to your house and their, their significant other is the same sex as them and nobody requires an explanation. Nobody has to justify. Well, and, and that's, that's, and that broadening out from, you know, the, the, you know, when I was when I was growing up, um, bringing home somebody who was a different race or a different religion, and there are places you know now where that's that would be uh, that'd be a problem. Um, if you want the utopian thread of the expanse, uh, the 
that's it. That's the one where we've we've gotten to a place where we've moved on to other definitions. And the problem is when you bring a belter girl home and she's right. a belter and you have to try to learn how to speak Lang Belta and embarrass everybody. That's that's uh, I, I like to think that at least in our version of the future, when Anna came home from seminary school with her black girlfriend to introduce her to the family, that there was no conflict. There was no Nobody had to explain anything. It was just like, oh, you're at his new girlfriend. It's so nice to meet you, right? Like, to me, that feels as utopian as the expense will ever get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. And in a way, like, it's not even utopian. It's just real because, you know, like, people have race may be less of an issue and sexual orientation may be less of an issue but now belters versus inners are the issue or you know different politics is the issue and that's kind of always what happens right there's always a evolving sense of what is and is not you know considered controversial or a problem um so i, I guess you could argue that that just feeds into the expanse as realism to show that there's continuity in there's always someone who is discriminated against. It just changes who that is sometimes. If uh, if there's anything that makes me secretly happy in the show that no that nobody else seems to notice because I never hear anybody talk about it. But there's a scene in season four where Holden's parents are talking to Naomi on the on the screen on the comm, and the fact that she's a belter makes it so awkward and they're trying so hard to be the open-minded parents and it has nothing to do with the fact that she's black it's she's a belter right and like that awkward family dynamic and and meanwhile his family if you look at the people behind him in the screen as he's talking to her there's a black couple back there there's a hispanic guy there's like like all of the various uh ethnicities are sort of represented in his family and the thing that makes it awkward is that their son is dating a belter <laughs> that, every time i see that it makes me happy yeah yeah it, it's like that things change but stay the same thing right yeah. humanity is still awkward but for different reasons <laughs> yeah and you're, they're you're trying always... i mean he, he's trying he's trying to speak belter Terribly, and, and, you know, and every generation is embarrassed by their parents. Yep. Everyone's getting Thanksgiving flashbacks from that one. <laughs> you mentioned Kara G before, and I thought it was it's always so much fun seeing Kara G in interviews and stuff outside of the expanse because she is unrecognizable almost from the character drama. Um, and you've talked before about how, you know, like drama speaks English as a second language and the way that she embodies the her beltiness is amazing. Meanwhile, I saw Marco on the Expanse after show, and uh, I'm sorry, what's his name, the Marco actor again? Keon. Keon, Keon, Keon yeah. Alexander. I saw Keon speaking, and I felt like I was watching Marco Inaros. <laughs> um, w what are some of the other sort of, you know, surprising similarities and differences that you guys see between the Expanse actors and the characters and the interplay between them? Wow. That's a... That's a hard question, actually. I mean, they're well, they're. You well, got just going to say I was going to say Stephen is much funnier than Holden is. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Stephen has a has a a good sense of humor and laughs. He laughs a lot more than Holden does. And and Wes is considerably less obviously dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I I still wouldn't pick a bar fight with him, but no, he's not a. He's not as scary as Amos. A lot of a uh, lot of nerd energy in Wes. Yeah, and but but Shore is awesome under any circumstances, and no matter whether you're looking at his Avasarala or just hanging out with her as Shore, she's she is awesome. Has Shore taken any of those costumes home? Uh, a couple, two, yeah, I think so. Yeah, two. She was saying she was saying they were like Joanne. Hansen, who was uh, our, our uh, kind of head of, of wardrobe. Costume uh, designer. Costume designer. Is that the, yep. yeah. That's the term. Um, had, her, had her take two. Offered her as many as she wanted, and sure, it took two. Some of those outfits she just owns to the point where I, I don't think anyone else should bother trying to wear them. 
Yeah, that that red coat outfit when she's walking through the snow in is, the snow. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like, yeah, I don't. If you own a long red coat like that, you should just throw it away because Shori, that's <laughs> that's her coat now. I got I got kind of like a Red Riding Hood vibe from the red coat in the snow. I I suppose that's incidental. Something that you just um, got me thinking about the whole sort of tribalism thing is that. You know, like I've heard it say, said that, you know, sometimes these categories that we put people in, these divisions, there are actually more differences between the people within those categories than there are differences between those categories, you know? Um, and I got a sense of that. I think one of the best bits of The Expanse Season 6 for me was when Joseph was arguing with Michio because Joseph had no sympathy for the Earthers whose world was destroyed while Michio did. Um, and I thought that was a great demonstration of how, you know, belters are not monolithic. None of these groups are monolithic. There is variation within them. And for that reason, those artificial categories that we impose are not as real as we, you know, sometimes think. Was that the intention there? Well, that, that scene is, is serving a number of purposes. Yes. To show that, that not every belter is, agrees with what Marco has done and, and, not every belter is angry about Mar what Marco has done, you know, to show the division there. But at the same time, it, the other thing that it's doing is it's showing Joseph trying to harden himself because, you know, it, you see in an, another scene where he tells uh, drummer, I'm a warrior now, what you, I'm a fighter now, what you always were. And he's trying to harden himself into that. And Michio doesn't have it in her to be hard in that way. It's just not something she can do. Um, so it's helping explain why they felt like they needed to get her off the ship. It's helping show Joseph's change in personality. It's showing the division and the belters. Um, the, the best scenes always carry a, a lot of water. The, there was a, I mean, uh, to, to give Ty the credit that I think he's due on this one, one of the things that was uh, a point he made in the writer's room the first season was that none of the sides could be monolithic. None of the sides could have only one character or only one uh, viewpoint. You know, the, the kind of the anti uh, thing. Where, you know, there's the, the, the tradition in science fiction, if you go to the planet with like the one biome and the one philosophy and everybody believes the same thing. And th this wasn't that. That was a, a, a point that, I think was well taken then. And I think it's informed the whole project. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, I, I, I hate, I hate monocultures and, um, I think science fiction uh, uh, for, uh, for a long stretch, science fiction had to fight its own impulse to create these monocultures. Um, and, you know, in early science fiction, like uh, original Star Trek, uh, it was okay because Star Trek was telling, you know, it was telling parables. It was, we were not expected to believe that the planet, where everybody loves flowers and their whole culture is based around loving flowers. That wasn't supposed to be a real place. It was a place in which this parable could be told. Um, and that was okay. The problem was then a generation of people watched that and thought, oh, that's what sci-fi is. And then you wound up with a lot of later sci-fi that was like, you know, we're the planet of people that only wear undershirts and you know, <laughs> our culture is based around undershirts. Um, that, that I think uh, is something to be avoided. And, and I did not want our stuff to, to follow that, that rule. I, I, I mean, honestly, in, in the older I get, the more I find myself rejecting that. Uh, one of the things that really intrigued me in the JJ Abrams star Wars movie, the first one, uh, what was it? Um, Force Awakens. Force Awakens, thank you. Um, I thought he was about to tell a story of, hey, look, not everybody in the Empire is bad with the whole Finn story. And, and I thought that was really intriguing. I was like, oh, man, I've been waiting for somebody to tell that story. I've been waiting for somebody to show not every stormtrooper is a psychopath. Like, these guys are just soldiers that wear you know armor that makes them anonymous. But, but there's a person in there. And when they told the Finn story, I was really excited because I was like, oh, are we finally going to get that version where, you know, just because you're a member of the Empire, just because you're a stormtrooper or whatever, doesn't mean you, you know, you goose step the Darth Vader and you think, you know, Palpatine is awesome. <laughs> it doesn't mean that, right? Unfortunately, they kind of backed away from that. And Finn is somehow magically the only stormtrooper with a soul. But 
I, I, I was very excited by that because it was, it felt like a movement away from that monoculture. Like everybody in the empire is like only one kind of personality. Um, so I get very excited when I see sci-fi where, you know, it's more muddled and messy than that. I, I had exactly the same reaction. I thought making one of the main characters in Star Wars a stormtrooper was the most radical and and like non-Disney choice to make in that first 15 minutes of Star Wars. But then they just sort of forgot that for the following they did, they three They did movies. nothing with it. I was so yeah. frustrated. And then, and then not long after that, you've got Finn in a TIE fighter on a turret blasting fellow stormtroopers and, and cheering. And it's like, you used to be one of those guys. Like, you probably know them. Like, yeah, like you know, yeah. take this, Robert. Ha ha, I'm orphaning your children. You know, like... <laughs> 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 it, 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 it took all the, the dramatic story potential of that idea and just sucked all the juice out of it. And suddenly Finn is the only stormtrooper with a soul. And yeah, uh, yeah. it was it was it was a real bummer. It, was, it felt like such a missed opportunity that, that they humanized and told the origin story of a stormtrooper with Finn in movie seven. But then in movie nine, they summoned into existence a hundred battleships full of stormtroopers and then killed them all i think i think they blew them all up uh, were they all fins yeah. did they murder a million fins on those ships we'll never know i it was bizarre well, and 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 that's part of i mean going back to the the project with the expanse making you wonder about that and making you think about all of you know naomi at the beginning of season six fighting the free navy and fighting belters and having it wear her down and hurt her i mean mm. that's mm. That that's the other way to tell that story, right? Yeah, and, and bringing that drama to the fore with Holden disabling the missile that was going to kill Philip and Marco and that ship full of people, you really made it a major plot point. The the moral difficulty of killing people, even in the context of a war. Well, oh, and 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 even in the context of entertainment. Yeah, I mean we're we're making entertainment here, and we're we're murdering a bunch of people, so that you know, the audience can clap. <laughs> we should be we should be uncomfortable with that, right? Yeah, and 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 for a very long time now, entertainment has told us that the one good man can dispense violence as justice, and and that is that's that's okay. That's, that's the right thing to do that, you know, the guy right with the white hat rides into town and dispenses justice from his six guns and he's the good guy. Um, and, and like, I like those stories too. So I'm not, I'm not bashing that kind of storytelling, but it's not the only kind of story that exists and it's okay to be skeptical of the righteous man dispensing justice at the end of a gun that it's okay to be skeptical of that. Um, and and there's and you will get pushback because some people don't want that subtlety in their entertainment. They just want you know, they want the good guy to show up and shoot people with blasters and and you know everybody cheers when they ride off into the sunset. Um, but I'm okay with with taking that criticism. I don't mind that. Um, I I want to be a little more skeptical of the ideas that everybody just sort of assumes are true. Yeah, if you're making art that nobody finds challenging, then you're not making art. Right. I'd love to ask a few nerdy book questions that have been niggling at me. Um, in Babylon's Ashes, I mean, I think that one of the best parts in The Expanse was Philip uh, leaving Marco, taking the name Nagata, freeing himself I thought was beautiful one of the details of that in Babylon's Ashes that I'm curious about is that when Philip is on his way to leave Marco um, he he sees a statue of a minotaur a big steel abstract statue of a minotaur what does that mean is that like the guardian of the labyrinth or something was it is it just a little flourish what is there any specific meaning to the minotaur i have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> there was a meaning that there was a meaning to the statue i don't think that what the statue was was the critical bit but um that's not the only time we see that statue in the books oh um 
because he's on what, which which station is he on? I, I have no memory of this statue, so I am I am baffled now. Yeah, no, I I, I, re- I remember this. We, it's I think it's Callisto. We- he's on Callisto, and there's like these branching paths, and he's going to get a ship and a job, and there's a statue of a minotaur at the crossroads. Yeah, huh. and there, and we see we see that statue earlier. I think through Alex's eyes. Oh. Um. So it was the 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 minotaur ness of it wasn't something I think we had any particular symbolic meaning for but that idea of these things happening in a common space that's right. why that that's why that's why that particular detail was i don't know why that stuck with me i, I yeah I, I don't remember the first time i don't remember that one but we will often do that where we'll have two characters in two different um uh, povs notice the same physical detail so then you can place them both in the same place. Uh, the reader knows that they're both. They were both in the same place. Uh, uh, that's so maybe, cool. yeah. Uh, but yeah, that, no. That there, there clearly was much deep meaning to that minotaur. <laughs> that. <laughs> well, I, I, I will say that probably the reason we're uh, you're even thinking of minotaurs is because, you know, you talk about the maze-like underground cities on like Callisto and other moons like that. Mm. Maybe that's why Minotaur was in our head because everybody lives in a maze, right? Yeah. And I think that makes sense in terms of like embodying a connection or a continuity with other characters, especially in the context of Philip on Callisto, because there's the whole thing about how he broke the Callisto shipyards and then he came back and it's like, it doesn't feel like the same place as the one that he bombed. And so that continuity matters. Um, another tiny nerdy question is that in book two, Avasarala is thinking about Alex and she mentions that, oh, by the way, Alex has a child that he doesn't know about on Mars. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. That'll come up. And then it doesn't come up for the next seven books. What was that? Why was that detail there? Well, uh, go ahead, Daniel. <laughs> you want this one or I can... Well, I mean, I, I'm interested to hear what you're. you're <laughs> I mean, I did is. write the I, I I did write the first draft of that chapter. I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure. So, um, no, the idea of it was um, that people have these lives, and they're not the only uh, reporter of them. I mean, that that comes back again, right? Um, that idea that you have an effect on the world and you have influence on the world and you can be a critically important person in somebody else's story and be completely unaware of it. Um, so, yeah, that kind of prefigures what happens with uh, Philip and Naomi. Yeah. Um, but, but in a much more uh, kind of uh, pedestrian way, um, it doesn't come up because Ava Sarala knows it and it's never in her interests to bring it up. It says, yeah. a, it says a lot about Ava Sarala that she never <laughs> bothers to tell Alex he has a son. <laughs> hey, hey, you know, that's, that's, that's putting your dick in something I don't know you want to be part of. It's like, yeah. And, I'm like, yeah. and Ava Sarala is, uh, as much as we try to you know, maintain a fair degree of gender neutrality, Ava Sarala is a woman. And she is aware of the reasons why a woman might want to have a child and not inform the father that they are the father. And why would she mess that up if she doesn't need to, right? Yeah, that's I mean, just asking for drama. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly, the, the, the woman who had that child made the choice not to tell Alex about it. She must have had a reason for that. And, uh, you know, why would Avastrola tip that over for no reason? The, the, the list of priorities on Avasarala's to-do list has Alex's secret son on about 148 in on her list of yeah, priorities. Yeah, she just right? never got that far down the list. Oh, yeah. Just like, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, and th- th- I, I will say this is a, the fact that you bring that up has reminded me of something I was thinking about recently uh, watching people react to the show is is... If you, and so everybody makes jokes about Chekhov's gun, right? Like if you hang a gun on the wall, oh, somebody's going to get shot with that gun, right? And they're, they're so used to that trope that they, that they make fun of it. Like, oh, well, that's an obvious Chekhov's gun or whatever. 
But at the same time, if no one ever fires that gun, people get irrationally angry about it. <laughs> so it's like they, they want to make fun of the trope. And at the same time, they are utterly committed to the trope. So like, I'm sure that there is a certain um, number of people who see the mention of Alex's kid that he doesn't know about as oh, an obvious Chekhov's gun. But no, it's just a detail about the world, right? You know, sometimes you'll describe that there's a gun hanging on the wall. Nobody ever fires that gun. It's just there, right? The other, so the other, the other version of that, the, the mirror image of Chekhov's gun is the giant rat of Sumatra, right? It's the, the, the thing that Holmes and Watson mention and then never go into at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's one of those fiction versus reality things, right? Because in the idealized, super efficient story, every detail serves a purpose towards furthering that story. Whereas in reality, reality is full of details that never amount to anything. Reality is well, full of Chekhov's guns that nobody ever fires. Yeah. But, but, but it does something to the story. It does, I mean, the fact that Alex has a son or a kid or, I don't know, a set of gender um, that he doesn't know about, part of what that does is it implies another life and a wider life, and it makes him feel larger than what is on the page. Yeah. So that does have a, a storytelling purpose. The giant rat of Sumatra is there to uh, fire up your imagination and make that world seem broader than it is. And that's not nothing. That's a, that's a useful technique. And I suppose one of the tricks that a writer can do is that instead of laying out the entire life story of every character in your series, you just give some evocative tidbits that compel the reader to imagine their own interpretation of this character's backstory, which can be as yeah. powerful, I suppose. No, I, I, I believe in having the reader do a lot of the work. Yeah. Mars's magnetosphere. One of the challenges with colonizing Mars is that we can give it an atmosphere, we can do all these things, we can give it water, but you've still got deadly radiation pounding against the planet, which is why you have the Martians living underground on Mars. Um, so in the books, there is no magnetosphere on Mars. But there is mention that there's a plan to create a magnetosphere on Mars. But I noticed that in the TV show, from about, I think, season two or season three onwards, we do see a magnetosphere on Mars, or we see auroras on Mars. Um, I'm curious, what is the story there? Why did you create? Why did you add a magnetosphere in the show? How did that come about? Well, there, there's a there's a way to do it. I uh, we uh, we talked about this in the in the red room, Noreen and I, that that uh, somebody had written a paper. And this is a little while ago, so I don't remember. Somebody had written a paper how you would go about creating a magnetosphere on Mars. And it's, you know, I mean, it's a big engineering project, but it's actually not an insurmountable one. And, and you know, we just like that idea of they've started working on it. You know, it's, it's, it's a thing that's part of the big project that they're doing. When we go to Mars in season four, you see the big atmosphere processors that are pumping mm -hmm. out atmosphere, and and you know, obviously the they've all made they've made progress on their magnetosphere project, and so the it, we want to we want to find the terraforming project sort of in mid stride when we get there. Um, it, it, is it a little bit like the water on Ceres, which was a recent scientific discovery that caused you guys to sort of shift the lore a little bit in order to explain yeah. why there is now no water on Ceres? Well, I mean, in the, even in the books, you know, we talk about that we're going to set up a magnetosphere. Um, just in the show, it's a nice visual to show that they've already started doing it. Yeah. Yeah, and getting getting those visual, getting those images that tell the story um, is so much part of the translation job. Yeah, yeah. having an aurora over Mars just... It, it tells you so much about what the project is and where it stands without anybody having to have a line of dialogue. Yeah. yeah it does remind me of the one thing I was, I was bummed we never actually got. Um, one of the things we were going to do is uh, if we got close to one of those atmosphere processors on the surface, we were going to show the gigantic pyramid of uh, massive Stonehenge sized blocks of ice that are stacked up next to it. That are being pumped, that are being run through the processor and converted into into atmosphere. Um, 
we never got to do that one. I, I thought that would be fun. I love the tragedy of generations of work being put into the Mars terraforming project only for it to be abandoned. I love the sort of tragic realism of that, that mega projects usually fail. Yeah. You know, context shifts. Any any project that lasts lifetimes will end in a different world than the one in which it, it began. You know, I, I think that's great. Hey, Daniel, do you remember that there's a famous cathedral that was started in the Middle Ages that was never finished? The famous unfinished cathedral. I don't and know. I remember reading about it. Um, I don't remember where it is, somewhere in Europe, but I remember reading about it because the person writing about it said three generations of people had already worked on this thing when the work stopped. And that that image has always been stuck in my head of, you know, there's there's something to aspire to in generational thinking, that idea of like we can we can aspire to build things that are great grandchildren will get to see finished. That's that's there's something aspirational in that. And at the same time, what you just said is sometimes those things don't work and you wind up with like half of a church out in the middle of nowhere and three generations of people wasted their time. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I find that um, frightening and cool at the same time. Yeah, and, and, and part of that paradox is that by the time you've finished your project, new technology that exists that makes your project obsolete. And an example of that is the Nauvoo that the Mormons built. They put all their resources, all their hopes and dreams into this giant generation ship to fly uh, slower than light to another star system. And then the bloody ring gates open and allow for instantaneous travel to all these new systems, making the Nauvoo completely obsolete. So good thing uh, it got commandeered before they set sail, you know. So, yeah, I love that experimentation with mega projects i, I believe uh who was, was it charlie strauss or was it Kit, uh stan robinson i remember but somebody wrote a story in which a generation ship goes out descends into barbarism and chaos halfway there and then a faster than light ship shows up with tourists looking at it <laughs> because like it's like you know it was sent out like 200 years before and now it's a tourist thing where like the tourists show up and they're faster than the light ship and look at it and meanwhile like generations of people have been murdering and cannibalizing each other inside uh because the system started to break down who wrote that story i i do not know oh. I know the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy talks about wars being declared and then a spaceship full of soldiers gets sent off to fight the war. But because of the time that it takes to get places, by the time they arrive at their destination, the war ended decades ago. Right. And these guys have nowhere to be. Um, well, that was, I mean, that was uh, Joe's you know, whole thing in Alvin, the Forever yeah. War, right? Yeah. Um, uh, the idea that these soldiers are sent out on these, you know, because of time dilation, it's not as much time for them, but from the home planet, you know, these 100, 200 year missions to go fight this alien species. Yeah. And and by the time you get there, you have 200 year old technology and the bad guys that are def on, on playing defense have 200 years newer technology. Yeah. Okay. So we've managed to be a bit structured in terms of spoilers this time i'd like i now like to declare a giant spoiler warning for the audience um because i'd now love to ask some questions about the later books and especially leviathan falls so spoilers for anything past season six and book six so quick recap in case you haven't read the final three books of the expanse book seven starts 30 years after the end of book six juarte and the laconians take over humanity in a strict authoritarian empire and the rossi crew become rebels fighting against them holden gets captured and imprisoned on laconia naomi becomes the leader of an underground resistance amos gets killed and then gets resurrected as a weird immortal zombie by the strange dogs the mysterious alien entities in the Ringgates start trying to wipe out humanity, so Juarte tries to stop them by using ancient alien technology to try and convert humanity into a hive mind, a giant shared consciousness without individuality, so the Rossi crew try to stop him. In the end, Holden and a Laconian called Tanaka defeat Juarte, and Holden sacrifices himself. He closes the ring gates, destroying the ring space. 
This saves humanity from being turned into a hive mind, and it ends the threat of the alien entities, but it also leaves all of the human worlds isolated in their own solar systems. In the epilogue, at the end of the series, 1,000 years later, we see Amos still alive on Earth, and the human worlds have started to make contact with each other once again. So that's what happens in the last three books of The Expanse. So, season six is said to be the final season of The Expanse, and many people are hopeful that we might get a screen adaptation of the next three books. You guys have said something may be possible, may not, but we'll see what happens. It, that, that's still where we're at, is it? Yeah. Yeah, well, we we don't actually have the rights to it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's an Alcon Entertainment decision. Um, and you know, they've been very uh, supportive of the project up till now. I imagine they will be very supportive of the project in the future, but I, I can't speak to, to what exactly that looks like. Sure. Um, one of the details I couldn't help but notice in season six, though, was that Clarissa found out that she had five years to live. And book seven of The Expanse, Persepolis Rising, begins 30 years after the end of the sixth book, which would mean that if you follow the timeline, Clarissa will be 25 years dead. Was there... Well, no, it says it's, it's, it's making an estimate. Um, uh, my mother has a close friend who was given a year to live with melanoma uh, 21 years ago <laughs> and is still plugging along. So, you know, those estimates have some degree of variance in them. The other thing, too, though, is, is part of what we're talking about in, in the later books of The Expanse is how dramatically human technology is changing over that 30 years, you know, um, that that the fact of the ring gates and the fact of the proto molecule and the and the way in which it recombined matter has opened up all new uh, scientific inquiries and you know metallurgy has changed and technology you know like uh, the way devices are built has changed because we've learned these things these new things um, I don't think there's going to be any problem if we were adapting book seven in justifying a very sick Clarissa still being around and she fly and she flies around in a hospital. So <laughs> I, mean, I mean, when you live in the hospital, uh, it definitely helps your life expectancy. And she could always just get a repair drone, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't. Those are, those are a weird tech. I, I, I wait for it. Wait for like the third generation repair drone before we start going to there. While we're talking about the repair drones, I thought the design of the repair drones in season six was really interesting because from Strange Dogs and the books, I was imagining a more robotic kind of a creature, like the robots inside the station in earlier books, like the one Miller inhabited. And yet the Strange Dogs looked very biological and organic. What, what was the design process there? Were you going for uh, something robotic well, or biological? Well, I mean, they also, they also sort of resemble... Uh, in some ways, the the thing that Miller occupies in season four, mm. um, the shape of the head is very reminiscent. Um, the way in which the re so the repair drone doesn't have a throat. You know, it has a mouth, but it's a manipulating mouth. It can grab things, but it doesn't it doesn't have any throat. And so the way it makes sounds is with 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 small hairs on its head vibrating. Ah. Which, if you look at the design, you'll see those hairs vibrating when the drones are making noise. Which is the same device that Miller used to talk to LV when he took over that device in season four. Is there was like vibrating hairs on top of that metal plate, and that's how he made sound. Um, so you definitely get the sense that the repair drone and that thing on Illus are from the same sort of design family. Came out of the same shop. Yeah, came out of the same shop. And yet you didn't have the strange dogs say ki ka ka. It's so cute when they say ki ka ka. Didn't do it in the show. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right. Let's let's talk about Leviathan Falls. Final book of the series has come out. Um, Holden's journey is obviously one of the fascinating parts of the story, which was evident from the beginning. It, you have the name of the character at the start of each chapter, and Holden's name changed from Holden in the last eight books to Jim in the final book. Um, what does that mean? What does that signify? It means he stopped taking himself so seriously. That the, the 
name at the head of the chapter is the way that that character thinks of themselves. Um, it's always been that, that that's, that is when the person thinks of themselves, that's the name that they use to think of themselves. And, uh, Holden as a military guy, you know, he was Lieutenant Holden. And, um, if you, if you've ever played high school sports, you know, that the coach always calls everybody by their last name. And so everybody in the locker room calls each other by their last name. Like no first names ever get used in sort of that male culture sports kind of arena. And Holden just kind of took himself seriously. So that was the name when he thought of himself. He thought of himself as Holden. And by the time we get done beating the shit out of him and drop him into book nine, he stopped taking himself so seriously. Yeah, there's a huge sense of vulnerability to Holden in book nine. Um, and he's very shaken by, like, the torture that he suffered in Tiamat's wrath. Um, and, you know, he talks about how he sort of almost is tired and sort of wants it to end. And so I, I got the sense of something almost, like, self-destructive or suicidal in his final choice at the end of Leviathan Falls, where he's doing something good for humanity, but it's he's also allowing himself to let go after a very damaging journey over nine books. Is that something you were going for? That's something that's really, um, I think, baked into the hero's journey. Actually, um, I'm going to I'm going to plug a book here real quick. There's a a book by Gail Carriger called The Heroine's Journey, um, which was the first time I heard anybody um, explicitly point out to me that the hero's journey is this type of Joseph Campbell thing that ends with the hero isolated or dead um and that was i mean then that's that's what we did that's a, that's a story structure it's a great story structure it's a very uh powerful it's very evocative it's one we like um and you know we knew for the better part of a decade how this was going to come down and yeah getting a hold into a place where that was the right choice for him that's that's part of part of what we were doing with this. Um, I've so I've, I have a kid. Um, my my daughter's kind of in her mid teens right now, and yeah, I absolutely miss the kid she was when she was three, and I miss the kid she was when she was seven. Uh, those kids were great. She's great too. I mean, this one's great. I I love this one. This one's awesome. Um, but she's not those. Um, and so yeah, I think that there is a kind of nostalgia that you can fall into with that but on the other hand stagnation is not much fun either yeah so. i it, that's it's funny you bring that up because i was i was just thinking about um my one piece of marriage advice i feel comfortable giving to people because i've been married for like 31 years and people are like how do you stay married that long and i've had guy friends of mine some of them who've been divorced multiple times say, i don't know how you'll, you stay that long with with the same woman i'm like because if you're paying attention she isn't that 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 the the girl that I married the 31 years ago is a is very different in some very fundamental and dramatic ways from the person I'm married to now. And it and if you don't see that happening, and you're not engaging with the new version as you go, you're just not paying attention. And that's on you. That's your fault for not paying attention. And um, I think it is what exactly what Daniel said. It's abandoning that nostalgia of like you know. I fell in love with a different person 31 years ago. Yeah, of course you did. And that person is gone. And now there's this new person and they're interesting in their own way. And they're like uh, intriguing in all new ways. And if you're paying attention, you can be re in love because you, you're like, oh, this new person has all these intriguing new facets of their personality that the old person didn't have. Um, I, I, th I think that if you take that you of the world like you're doing with your daughter like I do with my wife um, the, the nostalgia actually becomes an anchor rather than anything that helps you. you it's much better to sort of engage with the world as it is yeah the, the joy of aging and of changing is is that nothing stays the same and there's always something new um, let's talk about Tanaka so Aliana Tanaka is introduced as one of the main POV characters in Leviathan Falls. And I found it so fascinating that this character is probably the most dislikable and immoral P 
POV character in The Expanse. She starts out as a violent, manipulative asshole. Uh, and I thought for a moment that you guys were doing a redemption arc because she experienced this alien hive mind consciousness that kind of forced her to experience other people's lives in a way that might inspire empathy. But she viciously rejects that experience and dies beating a man to death, consumed by violence, giving a middle finger to the world. Um, I found it a really interesting choice for that to be one of the last storylines in the expanse what was the what was the intention here what were you exploring with aliana tanaka well, i mean uh it at the most basic level she is the avatar of individuality she is she is um a, a creature of secrets and personal space and will viciously guard that personal space against invasion and um, so is the person most threatened by what, Dar what Duarte is trying to do. She is, she is the person who is the, the personality that is most threatened by his goals. And, um, you know, like I said, vicious, will viciously defend her privacy, including beating you to death. <laughs> When we were when we were building her, the one of the the touchstones we talked about was Julia from 1984, somebody who uh, you know kept all the little rules and broke the big ones, um, and and that you know here's somebody who's lived in a viciously authoritarian uh, society and carved a space in it for herself that really works for her, despite the fact she's actually um, not a true believer that way. Um, she, she's made a space for herself that's genuinely for herself uh, in this culture that's trying to keep that away from her. And then, yeah. and then, and then face is actually losing that. And we wanted, I mean, we wanted that, that, the prospect of that loss uh, to be horrifying for her and for you, right? And it's a really cool example, I suppose, of the kinds of personalities that survive and thrive in that kind of ultra authoritarian world. You know, someone like Holden or Naomi would not rise to the level of power that Tanaka did within the Laconian system, but someone like Tanaka is the kind of person who is able to survive. Um, yeah. So, uh, Daniel brought up 1984. Um, and, uh, that's interesting because it made me think of what you're talking about right now, where, um, uh, one of the characters is thinking about the ideal that is presented of the citizen of the, the that they, you know, their fascist nation. And it's this tall, blonde, blue eyed man with a square jaw and pale skin staring off into the distance. That's on the posters. That's the, the ideal, but all the people who actually thrive, uh, he describes them as, as looking like beetles, <laughs> little scurrying dark men who scurry from place to place and, and stick to the shadows. Those are the people who, who thrive. And, um, what you're talking about just made me think of that because yeah, she, she has found a way to stay in the shadows. She is, she can thrive because she's found a place in the shadows where she can hide what she is. And so she can thrive in there and people who need to be out in the sun. They're the ones who get, uh, they're the ones who get destroyed by those regimes. Yeah. It, it, it like corners and compresses her humanity and our identity in a way that seems not terribly healthy. <laughs> in her case. Um, oh, well, I mean, she, she had a rough upbringing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, one tiny detail about the Tanaka story I found intriguing was that in one chapter she is talking to someone and she guesses that his military rank is chief. And then a few chapters later, she meets a character called Chief Bird. Um, and I was just wondering if that implies that, you know, the hive mind consciousness caused her to sort of get that chief word in her name before she actually met the chief guy, or maybe it's some timey-wimey thing like Miller and the Sparrow in season one, or I'm just reading way too much into this. Yeah, reading way too. It, it, <laughs> uh, they're in the Navy, and um, chiefs are like sergeants. In the Navy, chiefs are, are like sergeants, and so they're everywhere. 
There's a lot um, of chiefs. All right. Chiefs chiefs run the navy. So um when she's when she's guessing that person's rank, she's trying to guess like what's the highest rank that the person tending bar would probably be? I'm gonna guess chief. Um yeah, no, I had nothing to do with uh, <laughs> her running into another guy who is a chief. The the reason Bird is a chief is just to put a large gap between their two their respective ranks to create that moment of discomfort when Bird realizes that he's been talking to a colonel the whole time. Um and, and obviously she's not in the Navy, she's in the Marine, so you know. Uh, they're different, but the the respect for rank is is cross platform there. So his discomfort when he discovers that she's a marine colonel and he's just a a navy chief and he's been talking her ear off. That's the reason we made him a chief there. Cool. So I, unrelated. I really enjoyed Elvie's storyline when she's studying the B F A alien artifact, experimenting with Kara and Zan, grappling with moral issues. Um, th this challenge of like, how does a human understand an advanced alien consciousness? It reminded me of the movie Arrival, the movie Contact, lots of other similar sci-fi stories. And I loved the way you guys approached it by like, instead of dumping us with dry exposition about the history of these aliens, you gave us these interlude chapters where we experience the dream of this consciousness in a very poetic, metaphorical, dreamlike way way um so how did you arrive at that strategy how how, how were you choosing to explore an alien mind how, how did you get into the mindset of a billion year old alien hive mind is what i'm trying to ask <laughs> so I, I this is the two-part process i'll explain the first half because daniel has to do the second half so the first half is uh i i said to daniel um i've figured out what they are here's why they do things the way they do them here's why co-opting other life forms is just built into their biology and explained it to him. I explained to Daniel what they were and why they do the things they do and why the protomolecule made sense to them and the whole concept of slow life, you know, very slow metabolic processes. So, you know, projects that take millions of years are, they, they, that doesn't seem too long to them. And then Daniel took that and he wrote the dreamer chapters so that you have to talk about that dude, because that was all you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I think um, there's a surprising amount of E.E. E. Cummings in the expanse. Actually, uh, there's just uh, uh, a lot of uh, kind of the, the two or three poets who I actually really like. Uh, and I just kind of take uh, that voice and, I'm apparently pretty good at that kind of uh, only semi-coherent word salad thing where you I'm following an idea and I, I know where the idea is and I can kind of go uh, word by word and follow and phrase by phrase and I know exactly what I mean. And then I have a chapter after that where Elvie can say what the hell that just was. <laughs> um, but, but it was always, it was, it was always important to have those moments of kind of allegory and poetry and, and, you know, it's like, like with the investigator uh, chapters back yeah. in that. Um, and then also have somebody afterwards who can decode it. Because uh, th those are those are great for impressionist moments, and I think did some really cool imagery. Um, but I wouldn't have wanted to ask someone to make sense of them without some help. Yeah, I think that's an awesome choice to have both the ambiguous poetry and then the explanation. It takes me back to literature class, and you know, you get to have your own interpretation when you first encounter the material and then you're introduced to other interpretations which really gives you the opportunity to think about it in a lot of different ways um i yeah. I, I do love what daniel did with it uh, and he, he he's being a little modest because he's actually very good at that sort of impressionistic surreal stream of consciousness it is not easy style writing yeah it's it's not easy to do and, he, and he's very good at it so um like I, 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 the stuff I do is like the hard table on which he puts the paper. So I give him a table, he puts paper on there and he does all his crazy drawings on there. So, uh, 
that's that's pretty much it. I'm just I'm just providing a foundation for his. Uh, yeah, Ty Ty just does all the parts where he, it actually has to make sense and and fit together, and then I can muddy up all the lines. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but what I love about it is it is. It's not as it's not even as simple as you think it is. It's it's actually more complicated than you think it is because it's not just diving into the dreamlike recollection recollections of a species that has been dead for a billion years that was once a galaxy spanning hive mind. It's not just that. It is taking those recollections and filtering them through the mind of a 13 year old girl who has been 13 for 30 years. Mm. <laughs> And so the, the ways that Kara's brain, the words that Kara's brain puts to the images that she's seeing is part of the poetry there too. That, that if you had done the same exact thing with Zan, very different imagery would have come out of it. Um, because Zan would use different words to describe those things because he's a, he's a 10 year old boy who's been 10 for 30 years. Um, if you, and when Amos goes in there, he sees very different things. Yeah, because Amos has a very different word set for describing the images that he sees, and so it's it's already complicated because it's this weird surreal thing that's trying to explain. But it's even more complicated because it's that surreal shit filtered through three different brains. Mm. Um, and if you have to. Up. If you have to actually understand that to get the story, we're fucked. So, <laughs> so, so, so it should be there for people who, un- who can, can decode that and whose brains work the way mine happens to. But it should also, uh, it also has to have, you know, somebody who can say, hey, there's a table under this shit. <laughs> oh, but he's swirly shit. But this swirly shit, it's on a table. And then, you know. Well, I, I just need to make sure that if you rest your coffee cup on there, it'll, it won't fall over. That's, that's the level of plausibility I'm aiming for. That's, you know, th- this, is, this is part of why this uh, partnership has worked. Each of us kind of thinks what the other guy does is the hard part. Yeah. That's a. Uh... I don't know. I know you hang out on Reddit sometimes, Daniel. Uh, Somebody told me that there's some guy on Reddit who has taken all of the Dreamer chapters and decoded them. Have you seen that? I have not. I would oh, okay. love to see that. I should check that out. That would be. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious how close he got to what we were actually doing. Yeah. No, that, that sounds like an awesome symbiosis for the, for the creative partnership, being able to handle those different angles on the writing. Um, and yeah, having both the the poetic side and the expository side, it allows you to have your cake and eat it too, right? Like having the explanation come afterwards allows you to be courageous in writing the dreamer chapters because you can get as weird as you want and there will still be some clarity after and that. The, the clarity's coming. Clarity will be here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, you just have to train your brain to just sort of accept, I don't need to understand everything in this paragraph like accepting that uncertainty and ambiguity is always a good exercise um especially Uh, true of interpreting and and when when you're writing an alien point of view the part where it's all really explicable and obvious uh that breaks that's not doesn't ring true yeah Yeah. i i so did not want to do that version of it i you know there there were a couple of people who were who were frustrated that we didn't explain more about the the Cthulhuid horrors from beyond time and space and my only reaction to every time i get somebody sending me a frustrated comment like i wanted to know more about them like did you really though did you because the thing that makes them fascinating is that they are Cthulhuid horrors from beyond time and space if suddenly i tell you that they have jobs and one of them's name is bob and <laughs> like like you just suck all the mystery out of them. They, then now they're just now they're just bugs, right? Like you take your interesting aliens and you turn them into bugs. And yeah. we've seen bug aliens. So we're, we're, we've seen enough bug aliens. We don't need more. Um, yeah. I like keeping the mystery. I also I also like the ones the folks who who were hoping that the end would be that Holden uh, found some way to negotiate with the uh, right. <laughs> and it's like I we can't talk to a. Uh, an octopus you think we're gonna right no that's that would be so cheesy well and it's and so it's it, it is no offense to the people who wanted that but it is 
replacing the most generic trope of sci-fi onto their expectation of our ending. That that the 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 the, the two generic sci-fi endings for what we were doing, I think, are they find a way to talk to them and negotiate with them, which, as you said, we can't even talk to Octopus. How are we going to talk to something that doesn't even exist in our physical reality? And Or two, that we find a way to fight back and we take the fight to them and, and we battle the Goths, right? Like, both of those are... Both of those are the endings that I would be frustrated by if I was reading the book. Like, Well, and there's... The, but, but part of what that thing is, I think... Um, we, we have this talk a lot about um, closure and the kind of the desire for closure and kind of the way that the desire for closures is um, what we, you know, that's what we're catering to, but it's also a vice. It's also um, a, a thing that makes the story forgettable. Um, you know, one of the things we get called on a lot is, is that Philip goes off and Nomi never knows that she saved him. And I can't imagine any version of that story that would be more interesting than the one we actually did. Um, yeah. and, and that openness is, is built into that. Um, you know, we're back to the giant rat of Sumatra. We're, we're looping back. Well, the, what, the one I always bring up is, um, Apparently, some fans are incredibly angry that you don't know what the gold thing in Marcellus Wallace's briefcase was. Some <laughs> fans are really angry about that. Like, how dare you have all these people chasing this briefcase around and you never show us what's in there? <laughs> eh. We're never, we're, we have a gold thing in our briefcase. We're never going to show you what it is. We're, we're okay with that. Yeah, I, I did see a lot of people on Twitter who wanted to find out what will happen to Philip in the next book. And it's like the. It, it, it is the best thing he could have happened, that he gets freedom from having to be in the story. And, and that sort of goes back to what we've talked about before with, like, you know, Prax gets to leave the story. Anna gets to leave the story. That is the best thing that could have happened to them, you know? It, it's a little bit like a yeah. thing in A Song of Ice and Fire where the hound Sandor Clegane gets to retire and join a community of monks on an island and dig graves. And it is the most beautiful ending to a character. And I... I'm driven crazy by the people who say, yeah, but when's he going to fight back? When's he going to come back and fight the mountain? You know, it's like, no, please no. Um, uh, yeah, so I thought it was really cool the way the aliens were handled. I, I mean, you, you were saying about, you know, the impossibility of communicating with the aliens or warring with the aliens. And I kind of love Duarte's folly in trying to train the aliens not to kill people by sending... Uh, antimatter nukes into the other dimension and his sort of very logical, very well-intentioned, very understandable attempt to defeat the aliens with facts and logic fell apart and failed, I thought was, um, I thought was interesting. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a reasonable approach and it's reasonable that it failed with Duarte. Well, and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully the last book helps people understand a little better the, the madness of Duarte, uh, when they start to realize that he wasn't entirely in control of his own actions. Um, the, the more integrated he was in there. Yeah. Well, I, I, if you read the last book, I mean, it's definitely heavily implied that what he's trying to accomplish there is what the proto molecule wants him to do. Yeah. And that the proto molecule is once again, finding a new form of fast life and using it to, uh, you know, it's design and and uh, recreating, pulling them, pulling the hive mind back out of the BFE and putting it back into the world in a better form, Strenuous. the way it has done before. We're, 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 we're not exactly um, subtle. Not exactly subtle because <laughs> we have we have a we have a species that lives very 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 slow, and the way that it interacts with the universe is to hijack fast moving life and have it do all the stuff for it. And then it goes to war. It realizes it can't win that war. And so it hides and it hijacks new fast life. To fight that war for it. To fight that war for it. I mean, it's like, it's uh, Daniel calls them pathological moves. It's, it's the thing that you do when you're not thinking about what to do. Um, uh, the the proto molecule builders have one move and they just do it over and over again. They keep playing that card. 
And, and it's yeah. made and it's made clear that you know the builders have a they're not very interested in matter. Matter they could sort of take it or leave it. They exist more as sort of like information and light and stuff, which some of which seems to be stored in the BFE. I, I wonder if like. I wonder if, like, with the human hive mind that the proto molecule attempted to create, could that, you know, embody the builders as they once were? Like, is the proto molecule converting humanity into the builders, basically? I, I, oh, go ahead, Daniel. No, you need to take this one. Oh, I was just going to say, I, 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 I think that's kind of a meaningless question. I think, I, I, I don't think the builders think of themselves as, as any one thing. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like, it, you know, does, if you run your flight simulator program on your PC, or if you run it on a Mac, does the flight simulator think of itself differently? I don't think it does. Um, I think, I think the hardware is the least interesting part for the proto molecule. So the, so the builders and the proto molecule, they're not a organism so much as a process. Well, at at, at, certain, like. at a certain point, they became that. <laughs> I mean, I, go, hopping in as the the biology guy here, what is the difference between those two things you just said? Yeah, yeah, it's like the ambiguity of like a virus, right? Like, is a virus an organism, or is it just a self replicating? Well, and, okay, phenomenon? but how did we get viri? How did they? Get, how did how did that ever happen? How? Right. Well. There's one plausible solution, which is they used to be uh, bacteria that just carved away anything that was extraneous and carved away anything that was extraneous and carved away anything that was extraneous and outsourced all of their uh, manufacturing until you got this thing that was almost not alive anymore. So uh, what what is a process? What is a life form what is life what is alive that's a that's a religious and philosophical question um and it's not and and the gate builders um would absolutely challenge a bunch of our assumptions about that as they should any encounter with aliens should not answer those questions easily to be authentic (laughs) i think well and 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 they had a you know, a, a couple billion head, year head start on us. Um, and a very different path. Yeah. I mean, if, if you took a person from, you know, 2000 years ago and transported them to now, they'd barely be able to communicate with us. They'd be at, utterly baffled. And that's only 2000 years and it's within the same species. So you take something in and give it a two, mil, a two billion year head start on a different planet using entirely different biology. And the idea that we'll ever be able to understand that and make it make sense to us seems pretty unlikely. Well, Amos was comprehensible after a thousand years because he used the universal language of uh, grabbing beers and having a chat, right? (laughs) That's true, yeah. Amos is a very stable system. He has a very stable system. Even Even before he was changed, yeah. So thematically, The Expanse is about the evil of human disunity. It's about the evils of human divisions and the conflicts that arise from them but in book nine you introduce a hive mind that threatens to erase the differences and the divisions between humanity and create the ultimate form of unity so i thought it was really interesting and really ironic that in the end of the expanse by rejecting the hive mind holden and the series it rejects unity that would have erased our differences you know like it it complicates the idea that what we need is unity by rejecting the unity of the hive mind. Am, am I making sense? Yeah, no, I, I can follow that. Um, I would, I would, I mean, if I'm going to, if I'm going to get all, you know, critical here and um, I would question whether the, the central argument of the expanse is that um all disunity is bad. Yeah, I, w- I would say I, you know, the 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 thing we always kind of loop back to is the idea that there's more to it for all our for all our faults, for all our failures, for all of the kind of blood soaked 
history and the future and all of the terrible, terrible things you do, not, not erasing any of that, there's still more to admire in humanity than to despise. And in that frame, what Holden does makes perfect sense. It's yeah, a preservation and, and I, I, of the human spirit. Uh, or, or, yeah, or you, even just, I don't know if I'm as, as uh, spiritual as you, because I, I wouldn't use the human spirit. It just the, the, the biological uniqueness of us, you know, the, the, the biological and cultural uniqueness of us, the, the fact that we, as, as a species, we're, we're unique and interesting in, in a lot of cool ways. And not just throwing that away um, is is sort of Holton's argument there. But I, I think the central I think the central tenet of the expanse is something you wrote, Daniel, in one of the Naomi chapters, um, where she's staying with that person on I Baragayon or one of those other planets. Yeah, she's staying yeah, yeah. with somebody there. And the person s- says, um, I just want to get to where a person can be wrong and make a mistake and not die for it. Like that's that like that is her uh, that's for her that's the ideal that we should all be reaching for that that it's okay to be flawed and wrong and make mistakes and that there is mercy and that there is redemption and you know we don't just chew people up in the machine um, the minute that they show any flaws and I think that's really more the the central premise I think of the of the expanse is is trying to find that equilibrium, allowing for individuality, allowing for uniqueness and allowing for people to do dumb things that we would never have done, but they can still like, they're still part of our, our culture and we still take care of them and we don't just kill them for their differences. Um, that that I, if there's a utopia in the expanse, that would be it. <laughs> that, that we just stop killing each other over our differences, even when they piss us off. Yeah. It's not about erasing human difference. It's about accepting human difference and learning to live with it and tolerating it and going ahead and washing the dishes, even though your fucking roommate didn't do it. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, 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 that's heaven in the expanse. You, you yeah. just do a little bit more than your fair share and the, the kitchen gets clean. Well, that's, yeah. uh, who was it that said that it, it may, might've been somebody I know personally, or maybe I read it, but somebody once said, or I read, um, if you kill everybody who thinks differently than you pretty soon, you're all by yourself. Um, and that's, I think that's part of it is once you accept that that is reality, then you get more tolerant of everybody else kind of being stupid and, and from you your know, perspective. And as stupid as we are, and we are a stupid species and as <laughs> bloody minded as we are, and we are bloody minded. Um, and we are, we're, we're capable of horrendous genocide and cruelty and stupidity and we're still capable of doing amazing beautiful wonderful things and and we're still surprised when something horrible happens because because the kindness is so um so much what we expect you know it's 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 still the you know the 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 other line that we use um despite all the evidence we still believe the assholes are the outliers yeah yeah the evil's always there the good's always there we just got to nudge towards the good bit and and that and that that the future offered us by the hive mind right erases that yeah yeah, I, 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 it just when you said that, actually, uh, it just popped into my head that like humanity is a broken down old jalopy of a car with wheels that are out of balance and an engine that pings and seats that are threadbare and and terrible gas mileage and the Unity's version of fixing that is to crush it into a metal cube. Mm. And no matter how perfect the metal cube is, it's not a car anymore. And so, you know, Holden's saying, maybe, maybe we could tune the car. Maybe we could balance the wheels. Maybe we could put some new uh, slip covers on these threadbare couches. Let's not jump straight ahead to let's crush the car into a metal cube. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you make humanity into something that is on paper better, if it's not human, then there's no human moral value in this new thing that you've made. It's not a car. So, yeah, yeah we can't change ourselves into something other than car 
we just got to make ourselves into the best car we can that doesn't crash into stuff so much. Well, and, 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 it's, and it's a fucked up car and it'll keep crashing into stuff. And, and it's an ongoing project because every time we repair something, a different thing breaks down. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress for sure. Sorry, Daniel, I cut you off. What were you saying? No, you said exactly what I was going to say. Oh, okay, sorry about that. So um, maybe it's just because the new Dune maybe movie came out, but I see a lot of Dune in Leviathan Falls. Um, I mean, in book six, uh, the transport union Holden jokes that it should be called the Spacing Guild, which is a Dune reference. But also like Juarte in the later books is referred to as a god emperor and has similarities with our oh, spoilers for the later Dune books, by the way. Uh, Juarte has similarities to the god emperor of Dune and I, I and Holden, you know, in the way that he sort of takes Juarte's throne, takes Juarte's potential for power over the universe, but then Holden abdicates from that power. Uh, that reminded me a lot of the ending of the second Dune book, where Paul, who is the emperor of the universe, decides, uh, this sucks, this isn't good for anyone, I'm going to walk into the desert and die. Um, and also, like, you know, I, I, I found it, and I mean this in a good way, it's sort of like regressive or retrograde technologically to destroy the ring space and to cut off all of the human worlds from each other. Um, that's a step backwards in like a technological sense or like a, you know, scale of humanity sense, uh, which is also a bit like the end of Dune 4, the scattering, when all of the human worlds are left to fend for themselves and to sort of change and develop separately. Um, Do you, you guys read into the fourth Dune book, Daniel? I've read, I read the, the first book. one. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I never made it past the first one. I read the first two, so I never made it to that one where they get scattered. I didn't, I didn't know that that's what wound up happening. Okay, so so what were some of the influences, or or were there influences from other series that you guys were playing with with the ending? I mean, I, we're, we've never hit the fact that Dune is an influence. I mean, we have a line from Dune in the very first book. Oh, what's um, that? Well, uh, Julie, in her little diary she's writing of her descent into sickness and death, um, writes the line, uh, "Fear is the mind killer." Ah, uh, eek. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it, we've never hidden that fact. I I haven't read as far into the Dune books as you have, um, but um, I certainly, you know, I'm certainly familiar with Leto the Second and the whole God Emperor thing. But honestly, um, people have been declaring themselves God Emperors for a long time. Dune, yeah. uh, as much as I love Frank Herbert, he did not invent that. Yeah, I think the pyramids um, would have something to say about God Emperors. <laughs> I, I just I just recently watched a, a whole two hour video on the. Um, uh, on the Khmer uh, Empire in in Asia, you know that that a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago was like one of the largest empires on Earth, um, and the ruler of the their capital city was the God Emperor. He was, you know, he was he, he was declared to be a deity and and was emperor of their empire. Um, like people have been calling themselves gods for a long time, so. I, as well, much as and, I love Herbert, he didn't he didn't invent that. And and so much of I mean, not to not to you know take away from our brilliance or whatever, <laughs> um, but so much of the story that we told is baked into the stories we tell as a culture. I mean, you can there, there's a a strong argument that the rings are the Tower of Babel. Yeah. I mean, the, none of the patterns that we're drawing from here, none of the um, the kind of story cycles and and references that we're that that Herbert was pulling from, he didn't make those up either. Um, you know, the stuff that that we took from Alfred Bester, he didn't make up. Um, it's this is this is um, almost always what we're doing when we're writing these stories is retelling stories and reimagining stories. Um, the, the part where somebody does something completely original, I'm not sure that happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got, yeah. Campbell or Jung would say that the reason why stories are compelling is because they speak to something that is inside us in our psychology already, you know, art just evokes that what was already there. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sure the guy who wrote the Epic of Gilgamesh was ripping off some poor chump in the next cave. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, ask, I ask this only because I just started watching Firefly for the first time, but was Firefly something that was on your mind, that the Firefly TV show, while you were writing The Expanse? Was that something you were reacting to at all? Well, you know, uh, it's something that I really enjoyed a lot when it first came out. And I'm sure that it's in the back of my head the same way that, you know, Larry Niven and and uh, Arthur Clarke and all of those guys are, are back there. I, I think I ripped it off more directly for my fantasy series. I don't think we I don't, <laughs> I don't think we ever talked about. Oh, oh, yeah, that's yeah. We, we actually had that conversation about how. Uh, uh, um, shit, what's his name? Um, the, the mercenary captain. Um, uh, his or mine? Yours. Marcus Wester. Marcus. That Marcus was basically Mel Reynolds. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, you know. <laughs> you yeah. like, it, 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 it's all fanfic. Come on, it's all fanfic on some yeah. level. Well, you can call it fanfic or you can sound fancy and call it archetypes. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you want to be really uh, I, wacky I loved- about your fanfic. <laughs> I loved uh, Firefly too, and and um, don't think I was deliberately aping anything in there when I was coming up with the Expanse stuff. Because the one thing that always made me sort of, as much as I loved Firefly and I did love Firefly, uh, the performances in it are great. Uh, there's a reason every one of those actors has had a great career since then because they're all like the the cast of that show is maybe one of the best casts in in the history of sci-fi. Um, but at the same time, I was always really uncomfortable with that whole South will rise again sort of feel to it that like, you know, the, the, the Confederates continue to fight on and there are heroes. Um, little Dukes of Hazard for you. Little Dukes yeah, of Hazzard. Well, well, yeah, yeah, I was always vaguely uncomfortable with that. And, and I definitely don't have that in the Expanse. In the Expanse, our heroes are fighting to preserve uh, the institutions that allow humanity to exist and and thrive rather than being rebels for the sake of being rebels well preserve and, preserve and improve right preserve, yeah, preserve and, and improve yeah. yeah none exactly. of the heroes of the expanse are trying to resurrect something from the past they are all no. adaptive and willing to make things for the future yeah yeah no we don't we're not it, it, it once again, to go back to, I don't think either me or Ty, I don't think either one of us is really into nostalgia. No, no, neither of us is. So you guys are starting a new science fiction trilogy. Uh, I've heard you say that it's riffing on Ursula Le Guin and Frank Herbert in some ways. <laughs> I think I think the <laughs> phrase we used was the uh, disappointing love child. Yes. Of, yeah. Your words, not mine. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm curious, is, is there a... I, I also heard that you were plundering ancient Babylonian history for this one. Oh, I always do. I, 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 there's Babylon all over everything I, I do. Awesome. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge uh, pre-classical history fan. Um, and not just Babylonians. I, I, I'm fascinated by the Assyrians, um, early Sumerian cultures. Um, yeah, all of that stuff is like, like I, if there's a video on YouTube that's doing a deep dive into some, you know, like, you know, we're, today we're going to talk about the architecture of Ur. I'll watch all four <laughs> fucking hours of that thing, man. Like every time. But um, yeah, specific, like one specific period of Babylonian history um, that we were sort of riffing on a part of. Um. But I mean, honestly, it's it's not it, it. We're not rewriting Dune, and nor are we rewriting Left Hand of Darkness because I think neither Daniel or I believe we're talented enough to do those things. <laughs> um, what what we are doing is sort of talking about Galactic Empire in a way that maybe Herbert would have understood. And, and Asimov in Foundation. Uh, not not so much not so much the Asimov version of Galactic Empire. More more. Yeah, it, it, it's it, I, I like I like Foundation uh, the books, but um, no, not not very Asimovian, much more Herbertian. Um, and then the other thing was is sort of 
taking a, a, a little examination of gender as a biological construct um, in the way that uh, Le Guin did you know, with some of her work where she really sort of um, carved away the biology and culture of gender um, with, with uh, you know, I mean, but where people I, change genders. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that kind of thing. Um, it, just looking at some of that stuff um, as a way to examine culture and, and uh, biology when it comes to gender. And, 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 and the ways that it might be that aren't the one that we're in. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the nice thing about sci-fi is you can invent somebody else um, who has completely different views of gender than we do, and now we're not, you know, stealing somebody's lived experience to tell our stories. Yeah. Is there a title for this series? No. Well, the, <laughs> yes, we, there's some stuff we call it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so few of my titles actually ever make it to print, so it's, it's hard to say. I, I'm still disappointed we didn't get Dandelion Sky as the name for, for that experience. That would have been a good one. Would have been uh, we have an episode of the show named Dandelion Sky. Yeah. Because of that. Yeah. yeah. I, I noticed there's a Expanse episode called Critical Mass, which is the name of a writer's group you guys were a part of. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Mass, yeah. It's un, but actually, it's just that it's the same joke two different times. One was not related to the other. It's just... What's the joke? Well, critical mass is when you put enough of the uh, fissionable material together and it explodes. And uh, critical mass is, you know, criticism and there's a bunch of us. And then there's... You know, it's, 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 it's playing with the words. I, I, I don't think... Either, I don't think we named that one. I don't think... Don't no, that was, a, that was a Noreen name, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nure Nureen, Nureen, all, all, of the, all of the episode titles are, are Noreen's fault. So. <laughs> Ultimately, yes. Well, we, we can blame you for the finale episodes, though. The the book titles. Yeah. No, Narain Narain decided to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that there's a Expanse Telltale game happening. Were you guys involved in that? Uh, yes. I mean, it depends on what you mean by involved. Uh, the studio um, Alcon is is developing those digital projects. Um, they have asked Daniel and I to, on a number of occasions, to meet with, you know, uh, the studios, the the game studios that were pitching things and hear their pitches and give our notes and comments and stuff. Um, so we're involved in that way, but you know, neither Daniel nor I are like writing the game or anything. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people online dreaming of a a open world RPG MMO AAA mega expanse video game. Is do you share that dream? Is that something you'd like to see? Some, I mean, I'm sure I'm excited for the Telltale game, but would something expansive uh, be my um my infatuation with the MMOs ended uh, two decades ago or a decade and a half ago? Uh, my wife and I played uh, World of Warcraft for a little while because we could play together and then just fell out of it. And, I've, I've, and now I find, like, even when I'm playing a game and it has any, like, MMO kind of elements to it, like, I kind of cringe back. Um, so, no, I, my, my dreams of uh, the expanse of an MMO, I think, are, are long dead. But I would certainly not be opposed to, like, a cool, like, RPG if somebody wanted to do that. Um, I just don't need to do the... Uh, the MMO grind fest set in the Expanse universe. Yeah. Um, I've got a really easy question for you, um, and I'm hoping you can answer it because I can't. Uh, what's genre? What 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 makes sci-fi, fantasy, horror a different category than other kinds of storytelling? All right. <laughs> I got a rant. You want to take this first tire? Oh, no, no, this is all you, baby. All I'm right. ready. Um, so I'm going to talk about what genre is. I'm going to talk about why science fiction isn't one. You ready? Ooh, Here yeah. We um, genre is a set of conventions and expectations and storytelling that pools around certain concerns or fears. Um, the, for example... Uh, mystery is a, a, a genre that kind of c 
congeals around fears about injustice and violence. Um, romance is a, a, uh, a set of conventions and expectations that sort of congeals around issues of loneliness and isolation. Um, they're, they're, proje- they're, they're a gazillion different projects that all speak to the same core set of issues. Um, and whatever, whatever genre you have, it's, it's the set of expectations where those projects, where some, you know, out of the vast uh, collection of projects, those have sort of collected together, like, like, like asteroids coming out of dust. Narrative Science- gravity. Narrative gravity. Narrative gravity. They're, they're, they're narratives that uh, get this gravitational pull around some core set of issues. Um, science fiction is not a genre. There is no core science fiction story. Um, this is why Samuel Delaney, I, th- I think, this is why I, I think Samuel Delaney writes about science fiction being a mode of fiction. Um, you have mysteries in science fiction. You have romance in science fiction. You have, you pick up a science fiction story and it can be anything from, um, absolute technically, uh, beautiful speculation of plausible futures to Philip K. Dick doing whatever he was doing to Ursula Le Guin. Uh, reimagining gender and uh, justice and society to uh, um, Jack you know, Vance doing to, epic fantasy in a sci-fi setting. That yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, you don't know what science fiction is when you pick it up because it can be anything, and that's part of what we were playing with when we started the Expanse. We, that's why we have a noir. Uh, mystery, it, and then a political thriller, and then a haunted house story, and then a western, um, because all of those genres fit inside science fiction in a way that they don't in any other genre. Yeah, yeah. How can sci-fi be a genre if sci-fi can contain other genres? It's yeah, like a so super it's, category. It's not a. It's not a thing. It's it's something else. It's not a genre. It's something else. Awesome. While we're talking broadly, uh, is COVID changing storytelling? Has the waves of terrible COVID lockdown novels started yet at the publishing houses? What I, I know you guys experienced COVID limiting and altering um, the process of making The Expanse Season 6. Are you seeing COVID impacting storytelling? I mean, I'm sure it will. Everything does. Yeah, um, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure how, though. You know, I don't. I, if you had to ask me, what do I think this is going to do? When I talk to like other writers, um, mostly what I'm hearing right now is that it's really hard to focus and find the energy and find the the uh, the gas to really do productive work. So many of us are so exhausted and so scared and so worn by this. I, I'm guessing we're not going to really see um, what COVID has done to storytelling until it, you know, lets its foot off the gas a little bit, stops yeah. us quite so much. It's difficult to see the impact of a slow moving problem. Well, and it's difficult to make great art when you're just trying to pull your ass out of bed every morning. Yeah. Well, and 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 a lot of writers, Daniel and I's age, wrote thinly veiled Cold War stories because we were teenagers during the Cold War. So the you know the kids Scarlet's age, um, who knows what stories they're going to write twenty years from now after having been a teenager through a pandemic and then you know are we going to get the thinly veiled pandemic stories the way that people my age wrote thinly veiled cold war stories yeah can you, you know? imagine can you imagine being uh, a teenager and spending three years on the couch with your parents i would have i would have killed them both 
<laughs> I'd, I would be in prison because they would not have made it off of that couch. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it cannot not have a huge impact on entire generations, and I guess it's going to take a generation to see that full impact, perhaps. That'd be my guess, yeah. And I think, I think anybody who's trying to write a COVID allegory deliberately right now is probably writing a bad book. Yeah, that's my I think, I think you I think you got to wait until it percolates for a while and the, it shows up sort of almost without your intention. That's when you'll get some good ones. Yeah. Yeah. When people write COVID novels without knowing that they're writing COVID novels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, there, there are plenty of people who wrote Cold War novels and didn't know it when they were doing it and then found out later when they read the, the reviews. <laughs> oh, and AIDS novels. AIDS, AIDS stories. novels, yeah. Yeah, yep. I, I I wrote an AIDS story one time, and I didn't know I was doing that until I got at the critique group. I, I rather yeah. enjoyed Animal Farm as a endearing story about animals before I knew anything about Soviet Russia. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you guys can't. I know you guys don't know if there'll be an adaptation of the final three books of The Expanse. Um, but I'm curious what happened to the physical sets, like the Rossi set. Like, I know that those sets were retained after the Expanse's cancellation by Sci-Fi, so they were reused after Amazon picked up the show again. Do you guys know if, you know, the Rossi command deck is sitting around in a warehouse in Toronto somewhere right now, or is it being, uh, or is it not? Do you guys have any idea? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I have... I've... So Manny, who was our line producer, uh, that was his job. Um, I've never talked to him about what, what ultimately they they did with those. I mean, they always they would always break them down and put them in in basically in tractor trailers for storage, because um, it was much cheaper to do that than to keep eighty thousand square feet of stage space. Um, I but I don't know if they've done that or not. I don't know if they're all sitting in a in a tractor trailer somewhere or who knows. Yeah. Or if Manny took them home and that's what his living room looks like now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I will say, though, that the, in, in the modern age, that is much less. So before we had really good 3D scanning, losing the sets was a big deal because um, they had to be recreated from basically still photographs. Uh, and, and they never quite were right. But now every set we've ever built has been... Uh, 180 percent or in 180 degree not 180 degree excuse me, 360 degree uh 3d scanned so we basically have all of our sets in vr and so even if something happened to those sets and they wanted to rebuild one or more of them um we have a huge head, head start on that over what they used to be able to do 30 years ago when those mm. sets were lost um you know they 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 can pull the the scans of those sets out and give us an absolutely perfect 3D map of what that interior was like and once once the set guys have that they can rebuild it and no problem so what i'm hearing is that the rossi lives <laughs> well it, it certainly lives as a uh, bunch of data files on some uh, vr computer somewhere uh, chris danelon who you may have seen on twitter um he was uh, he was in our VR department. He's posted a lot of stuff about the sets being built on Twi on uh, YouTube, and um, has a lot of like cool VR stuff about the show. Um, so I'm imagining Chris has got a computer a backup server somewhere with all the sets on it. Could do a nice VR tour in one of those things. Check oh, I've done yeah, I've done it actually. Um, I've I've done the VR with uh, when we were doing. This was a couple seasons ago, but when we were setting up a new, a brand new set, and Jeremy Benning went in to do his uh, his lighting setup, um, Jeremy would go in in the VR and and he could make notes about like, yeah, I'm going to put a light strip there and I'm going to put a wall a light wall there and like that. I was actually in there with him watching him do it uh, a couple of years ago. It's pretty cool watching uh, the cinematographer design the lighting for a set in the virtual version of the set. Awesome. Maybe the metaverse won't be all bad. No, I think oh, it well. will be all bad. <laughs> yeah, nothing good. Nothing good happens there. Oh, yeah. Um, 
you guys have been so generous with your time. Thank you so much. I'll ask an easy question, really easy question for the last one. You finished this decade long project. If you put aside your, humil- your humility, what impact do you hope to leave in Fans of the Expanse? What do you hope that fans remember or take away from the story years later? I'll tell you the thing that that um, I've you know not 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 what I I necessarily hope people will do later or any kind of weird prescriptive thing, um, but the folks who have reached out to us because um, the story wound up being a a bridge between them and their dad or their kid or um, some, some, a shared experience where, you know, we've had some people who, whose uh, parents were very sick and this was a way for them to, uh, to talk to them and to have a, a, a part, to be a part of that relationship for them. Um, and those always kind of blow me away. The idea that there was um, this real human connection that our project like facilitated, with our, we catalyzed without us being involved in it in any way, um, but that it, that that was meaningful for them and it, it made somebody else's life actually better. It's um, like Naomi helping Philip, though she never mm-hmm. knows it. Well, except they, they wrote me an email and I, I found out <laughs> and it was, you know, all warm and fuzzy. Well, but that's the thing for everyone who does send you an email. There's a hundred who don't. Yeah. Well, you know, I hope that's true. That'd be I great. already, I already got my yayas. I already, I already, I, I'm, I already feel like um, my version of that has happened. So uh, Daniel and I were having a conversation with Ann Leckie. Uh, uh, this was a couple of years ago. And she told us that she thought the only reason she was able to sell Ancillary Justice is because Leviathan Wakes had done so well, and suddenly people wanted space opera. Um, and if Daniel and I, if even one percent of that is true, and so Daniel and I are in any way helping this wave of amazing women space opera writers who have just been like pouring into the scene over the last decade, if if we have even one percent of the responsibility for cracking the door. So that they could come pouring in, that I I've already gotten all the, all the self love oh. that I need out of that. Yeah, because I mean, look at all it, like you got Anne, you got Becky Chambers has come in and like just come in like a storm. You got Martha who's like ruling the world now with Murderbot. I mean, like all of these things. If well, if even one percent of that is our fault, I I will feel amazing. And Arkady Martin, she Arkady won the Martin? she won the the Hugo same night we did. Yeah. Uh, so if if we cracked the door a tiny bit with our silly space opera novel, and this wave of amazing space opera writers came pouring in behind us, that that's I already feel like I've, I've my legacy is is secured with my you know point one percent help in getting the door open. That's awesome. Yeah, it's um it's awesome to know that the story about spaceships and strange dogs has measurably made lives better. So. I think that's an awesome achievement. Well, if it has, um, I'm going to take credit for it. And if it hasn't, I'm going <laughs> to pretend like I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm looking forward to The Age of Ash next month and The Sins of Our Fathers novella uh, and the next trilogy from James S.A. Corey. Well, cool. we will have them out to you uh, shortly. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Thanks for your time, guys. Thanks. So, Daniel, yeah, I, I want. Are we splitting the money? For which? Uh, for for your obvious Coca Cola sponsorship. <laughs> it, I, I'm getting half of that money, right? The half yeah. of the Coke money. It's, yeah, I, actually, uh, you'll get half the Coke uh, when they <laughs> when they send me the the uh, the flats of Mexican Coke. I will send some on to you. Awesome. All right. As long as I'm getting half. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Alt Shift X podcast. Please subscribe on YouTube or Spotify or your favorite podcast app. 
The next Alt Shift X video will be about Dune, and there'll probably be a Dune episode on this podcast as well. Special thanks to the patrons for supporting Alt Shift X. Cheers.